Welcome once again to our YouTube channel. Thanks for subscribing to our channel. We really appreciate you for all that you've done. Uh, today we want to look at the YX 2023 Agri Science Practical Specimen. The YX 2023 Agri Science Practical Specimen. So we'll be listing the specimens after which you we'll quickly have a rundown of some of the possible questions that you can come across in the uh, YX exam itself. So let us quickly list the specimens out. We have a uh, specimen A. Specimen A is earthworm. Specimen A is earthworm. We have specimen B to be termite. Specimen B is termite. Specimen C is the loamy soil. Loamy soil. That is our specimen C. And our specimen D is sandy soil. We we'll quickly list the specimens so we will get ourselves familiarized with them. Our specimen E is water trough. Water trough. That is what our specimen E is. Well, our specimen F is the feeding trough. The feeding trough. We have specimen G to be the egg candler. Egg candler. That is what our specimen G is. And specimen H is scoop net. Scoop net. Specimen I happens to be sugar cane. Sugar cane is our specimen I. And then we have specimen J to be the pineapple fruit. Pineapple fruit. And then specimen K is ginger. Specimen K is ginger. We have specimen L to be honey. Specimen L is honey. Then we have specimen M to be sawdust. Sawdust. Specimen N is our wood shaving. The wood shaving is our specimen N. Wood shaving. Specimen O now. Specimen O. Sorry. Specimen O is the electric bulb. Electric bulb is our specimen O. Then we have specimen P to be the kerosene lamp. Kerosene lamp. That is our specimen P. And then we have specimen Q to be charcoal pots. That happens to be the last specimen for. Uh, the agric uh, list of specimens for year 2023 YX. So we have listed them. These are the list of specimens that we'll be talking about. Uh, a is earthworm, B termite, C loamy soil, D sandy soil, E is water trough, F feeding trough, G egg candler, H is scoop net, I is sugarcane, J is pineapple fruit, K is ginger, L honey, M sawdust. N is wood shavings, O electric bulb, P kerosene lamp, and Q is the charcoal pot. So we'll quickly be looking at each of them one after the other. We'll possibly give some pictures to uh, clearly show what we are talking about uh, to aid the teaching. So let us go straight to taking the first specimen. The first specimen is the earthworm. Specimen A. Specimen A is the earthworm. So that is where we are going to kick it up from. The earthworm. So let us see what we have for the earthworm. Now the earthworm is, let me start with saying it is a macro uh, decomposer. It is a macronutrient decomposer. It helps to provide nutrients to the soil. So first, let me tell us what its botanical name is, or uh, its scientific name rather. It is called the Lumbricus terrestris. It is called Lumbricus terrestris. Lumbricus terrestris. That is its uh, scientific name, Lumbricus terrestris. Now, it is a terrestrial organism. That is what that is telling us. It is a terrestrial organism. A terrestrial organism. 
meaning it survives on land, though its own niche is under the soil. It burrows into the soil, that is where it is usually found, and then it possesses segmented body. Yes, possession of segmented body. Possession of segmented body. Now, if you look at the picture, like what I will be showing you here, this picture here is telling us that it has lines cutting across its body parts. You can see it. So those are the things that make or uh, that show its segment, the segment of the body of the earthworm. Now, uh, we also can say that they are, like I said, that they are decomposers. So they feed on decaying roots and leaves. They feed on decaying roots and leaves. Yes, that is what they feed on. Uh, they, 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 are, they, they are agricultural uh, aiders. They aid agricultural processes because they burrow into the soil. So they help uh, in agricultural processes. So like I said, that they feed on decaying roots and leaves. Those are not the only things they feed on. They also feed on nematodes. Uh, they feed on nematodes. They feed on protozoans. So those are the things that you have the earthworm feeding on. So averagely, they are hermaphrodites, meaning they possess they are hermaphrodites. The hermaphrodites. So they are actually possessing the two uh, gamete cells of uh, living things, that's the male and the female gamete cells. So they can actually reproduce on their own. So we can also say that they live, yes, I said that earlier on, uh, they live in the soil. Now they, they decompose uh, organic materials and they can also be fed upon by birds, uh, snakes and the rest of those. Now, an average earthworm can live up to about uh, uh, between three to five years or eight years thereabouts. So we have, uh, that is how they, they live their life. So the characteristics now, is that they have long cylindrical and segmented bodies, possession of segmented and cylindrical bodies, So that is uh, uh, one of the characteristics. They also have hydrostatic skeleton. Yes, that is another very important one that we need to know. Hydrostatic skeleton. The type of skeleton they have is not exoskeleton, nor is it endoskeleton. Theirs is hydrostatic, meaning it is filled with fluid. And the fluid is pressured by the barriers of the body of the earthworm. So that makes it possible. It enhances their movement. Hydrostatic skeleton that aids movement, aids their movement and their structure. Their movement and their structure. So that is that. They also have the CNS and the PNS. Yes, they make function, uh, the, 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 their body function with the aid of the CNS, the central nervous system, as well as the uh, peripheral nervous system. They possess the CNS, possession of the CNS and the PNS. So we need to know that as well. Now, the, we have said it earlier on the hermaphrodites. So the kind of excretory organelle that they have is the nephridia. Excretory organelle for the earthworm is uh, the nephridia. So that is their own. Uh, excretory organelle, the nephridia. So quickly let me give us uh, some classifications of uh, the, this particular earthworm. We know that the kingdom is Animalia and so the class the class is OE. Let me start from its phylum. If we have said that the kingdom the kingdom Animalia Animalia, then the phylum. The phylum is we have it to be Annelida. The Annelida, they are Annelids. The class now, they are Clitulata. So you may be and may not be asked all of this. The order now, 
other, it is the lumbricus leader. Lumbricus leader. And then let me just go to the family. The family is Acanthodrita. And then we have the genus and the species. Genus uh, as the lumbricus and species to be the terrestrial. So that is what makes up uh, its scientific name. So that is what we have for the uh, earthworm. So if you look at this, this is a diagram showing its labeling. We have the head end. We have the mouth here. We have the head end. We have the mouth here. This part here is called the clitellum. This part here, all earthworms have them. It is called the clitellum. Then we can see all of the segmented body that it is being uh, literally shown. And here we have the tail end. So that is what the diagram of the earthworm looks like. So let us go to the next specimen, which is specimen B, termite. Specimen B. That's it, termite. So termites are social insects. Termites are social insects. Social insects. And this is because they live in organized setting. They live in well-developed and organized setting. There are different castes. We have their castes. They have three major castes. We have the reproductives. The reproductives, which is made up of the king and the queen. These ones are responsible for reproduction. They are responsible for multiplying the caste. And then we have the soldiers. The soldiers are oftentimes the winged termites. And then we have the workers, which are the wingless termites. The workers. The soldiers usually have very, very strong mandible and uh, the cephalothorax. So those are their uh, characteristics, the characteristics of the termite. Now, the uh, scientific name of the termite, we have it to be Isoptera. The scientific name is Isoptera. That is its scientific name. So they are herbivores. Termites are herbivores, meaning they feed majorly on plant materials, even though we know that they feed on some other substances like wood, like book, soil and the rest of those but majorly they are uh, herbivores plant eating organisms now there is this particular thing that is called the nuptial or wedding flight the nuptial or wedding flight now this is done by the uh, supposed or king and queen to be they do that in preparation for nesting they do it in preparation for nesting because when they go on this particular flight, you have the king and the queen uh, attaching themselves together during the flight. And by the time they land on the ground, they lose their wings and then they walk themselves into the establishment of their own colony. So that is how their caste is. So we have the caste system, which is an example of a polymorphism. Polymorphism is talking about the differences of some creatures in various forms. Differences of the same creature differences in appearance of the same creature but in different forms carrying out different functions so now let us quickly look at their uh, economic importance the economic importance because you could be asked that particular question economic importance of termites economic importance number one is that they maintain soil fertility yes they maintain soil fertility because they help to grow into the soil thereby aiding the uh, breakdown of dead trees they, they aid the breakdown of dead trees as well as permitting uh, the movement of air and water in the soil so the air uh, by breaking down by breaking down dead trees dead trees 
uh, number two, we say that they improve soil drainage. Improve soil drainage. Yes, that is another function of the termites. Then the flying termites are very, very uh, nutritious. The flying termites are eating. They are eating for the fats and protein that they contain. For fat and protein. Yes, we have that. Then they are responsible for the destruction of wood. Yes, that is uh, the commonest uh, function that we know for them. They destroy destruction of wood materials. Destruction of wood. So that is what they are commonly known for. They help to destroy wood. wood that is used for construction. Also, we have uh, the termitarium, which is their, uh, their dwelling place, their abode. That is their niche, the termitarium. Or their nest, which is used for uh, production of uh, the lawn tennis court. It is used for the production of lawn tennis court. Because of the, uh, the elastic uh, nature that it has. So it is used for the lawn tennis court. So these are few of the, uh, the uh, few of the importance, the economic importance of the earth worm. Uh, sorry, of the termites. Few economic importance of the termites. Now, let me quickly tell us that termites they have incomplete metamorphosis. Incomplete metamorphosis. They have incomplete metamorphosis because they go from egg to from egg they go to nymph and from nymph they go to adults. That is their uh, their life cycle from egg to nymph from egg to nymph and from nymph they go to adult it is this adult stage that we now have them differentiating into the three cast which is the reproductives the soldiers and the uh, the, work the workers so this is what uh, the picture of the termites looks like you can see the picture of the termite here you can see the, the head so this is an example of a soldier you can see it having the big mandible and the piercing uh, mouth part. So it is very, very good at biting and chewing. So this is an example of a termite. So we'll be going to the next uh, specimen now. The next specimen, which is... Uh, we have the next... Okay, let me see. We have the next specimen. The next specimen is going to be our specimen C. Specimen C. Specimen C, which is the loamy soil. The loamy soil is our specimen C. So what does the loamy soil have that we need to talk about? First and foremost, let me talk about the composition. The, soil, the loamy soil is made of the sand, silt, and clay uh, composition. We have sand, sand to be 40%, sand 40%. We have silt also to be 40%. And lastly, we have the clay, clay to be 20 percent so this is the composition of the uh, the loamy soil it is agriculturally very very viable agriculturally good this agriculturally good because it's of because of its uh, uh, high humus content because it contains humus it contains humus. Now, this humus 
has an active ingredient in it called the humic acid. There is what we call the humic acid in the humus. So it is agriculturally very, very good. Now, the, uh, we said it is agriculturally good because it has more nutrients and moisture than the, uh, the sandy soil. It has more nutrients and nu moisture than the sandy soil. Yes, that is one of the factors because it has more nutrients more nutrients and moisture than sandy soil. Very soon we'll be looking at the sandy soil as well because we have to relate them to one another. Now, this particular soil helps for anchorage to the plants. Helps to anchor plants, preventing them from falling to anchor plant roots plants from their roots or with their roots so that prevents them from falling uh, then it is better drained than the uh, clays and seals it is better drained better drained because the clay soil does not permit water to drain out of it unlike the the loamy soil which is better drained than the clay than the clay and seals those are, that's another class of the uh, uh, the loamy uh, uh, another class of the soil soil types. So it improves the soil texture. It improves the texture of the soil. So those are the uh, characteristics of the loamy soil. Now let us quickly look. I said it improves or it has improved te uh, soil texture. Improved soil texture. So these are the characteristics of the loamy soil. It said it is the best for planting practices. So this specimen D now, specimen D, which is the sandy soil, sandy soil. We have that to uh, be another class of the soil types. So the sandy soil has high porosity. High porosity because it permits almost all the water in it out of the, the, the soil type. High porosity, as uh, well as uh, it be having the smallest fine particles. The texture now, it has the smallest or fine particles of the soil grains, fine particles of weathering rock. Of weathering rocks. That is what that uh, particular uh, soil type has. It is very, very poor for agricultural uh, practices. Poorest for agricultural practices because it does not permit the plant, uh, the, the soil to have access. It does not permit the plant to have access to nutrients in the soil because it has drained out all the nutrients in the soil. And that is because of its nutritional value. Because of its low nutritional value or soil fertility. So these are some of the reasons why we say that this particular soil type is not good. So you could be asked to give an experiment to show that uh, sandy soil is uh, more draining, more porous than loamy soil. This is how you go with that experiment. Let's assume you have two soil types. You have soil type A and soil type B. And you are given 20 grams, 20 grams of of A and you're given 20 grams of B2. So this is what you do. You get a setup which is going to be uh, you have a beaker you have a beaker in which you have a funnel now in the funnel at this place here you try to drop cutting wool here 
to prevent your soil type from falling into the funnel when you actually want to uh, pour your soil into it so this is how it is going to look you have your beaker having its content so we are going to designate our soil type A with this green dot so our soil type A you have poured your soil type into the funnel so in the set of B now you have similar structure we have something similar to what you have just drawn we have the beaker then the funnel we have the beaker and the funnel and then inside it you have your cotton wool again you have your cotton wool here so if you have your cotton wool here permit me to make this very very neat So, we have this, okay, we have our funnel looking like this, and so inside this we are putting uh, some uh, cutting wool to prevent our soil from running through it and our second soil type soil type b we're designating it with uh, these blue particles these blue shading so after which you're going to run water into it so you are adding water let's assume you are given a liter of water that is 100 cl of water plus 100 cl h2o the same thing for this one here plus 100 cl h2o so by the time you add your water into it you found out that the water that got drained into this place here you have your water that got drained into soil type a and here you have your water that got drained into soil type b Remember, you have added the same quantity of water into the same uh, measurement of beaker, the same beaker measurement. So, after which, uh, after the setup, after the experiment, you found out that the amount of water that was collected in setup A is less as, let's say, we collected uh, 20 cl of water in the beaker of A. And then in the beaker of B, we collected, let's say, 60 cl of water. So that is telling us that in A, we have 100 cl of water that has gone in, giving out 20 cl. That means this one has actually held on to 80 centiliter of water. On the other hand, the B here, the B also, the B also took in 100 cl and you added uh, the water and then it drained out 60 cl, telling you that 40 cl is what you got out of it. 40 cl is what the soil has, what has held on to. So this is telling us that you find out that the one that is most porous, the one that has permitted a uh, more amount of water to go out of it is the B. A has actually held on to about 80% of the water, while B held on only to 40% of the water, allowing 60% to drain off. So that is the uh, is, uh, experimental setup showing the kind of uh, uh, draining or porosity that we have in this particular experiment. So this is what the loamy soil looks like you can see it having uh because it has water in it it has some moisture in it you can see some of the soil particles clogging together so that is how the loamy soil looks because it has high content of humus in it and if we look at this we will be seeing the uh the sandy soil if you look at this okay if you look this way we'll be seeing the sandy soil 
this is an example of the sandy soil so you can see the difference between them so this is how loamy soil looks and that is the sandy soil so we will look at the next specimen now so the next specimen we'll be having now is our specimen e specimen e specimen e which happens to be the water trough water trough now what is the water trough and what is it used for the water trough is an agricultural uh, feeder or we use it in giving water to the, uh, the uh, animals to farm animals it is used sorry used to give water to farm animals that is what the uh, water trough is mainly used for we have said we have them in different shapes we have some of them or the uh, common ones to the uh, the box like they are usually found in box like shape they are man-made they are man-made and they are actually uh, made from steel they are man-made man-made from materials like steel we have some of them made from concrete we have some of them made from plastics so these are the materials that are used in making this uh, uh, particular thing that we're talking about. So they are used for feeding animals. It could be livestock or poultry animals. Huh? Livestock or poultry. So whichever one that you are using is what they are used for. So this is an example of the uh, specimen we're talking about. This is what the specimen we're talking about is. You can see this is an example of a, feed, uh, a water trough. The water will be found in this container in the middle here. So it permits the uh, animals access. It gives the animals access to actually having a drink of water. So the next specimen we want to look at now is the specimen. We have the specimen. The specimen F. Specimen F to be the feeding trough the feeding trough now the feeding trough is somewhat like the uh water trough the only difference there is that the feeding trough is for feed while the water trough is for water like the name implies this is used to house or contain animal feed to house or contain animal that is what it is used for so any farmer that is uh, actually uh, an animal farmer will always need a feeding trough now they come in different forms some of them are wood made from wood we have some of them to be wood some of them are steel we have some of them to be concrete some of them as well are plastics in nature so those are their functions so now this is it they help functions now or advantages functions or advantages one they keep the passage clean and clear keep the passage clean and clear because you will not be having the feed littering the floor you keep food animals clean and within reach keep food or feed of animals clean and within reach it will be easily accessible be easily accessible for the animals they are usually tough and durable products yes so they are not easily destroyed by the animals tough and durable they are not easily destroyed by the animals and then the ones that are steel they are actually not uh, rusty so they are rust and corrosion resistant rust and corrosion 
resistant. Yes, they are actually rust and corrosion resistant. So we can have them for the ruminants as well as the, the poultry. Now we have the different types. Types now. The types. We can have the hanging trough. Hanging trough. We can have the hay feeders. The hay feeders as well as the last one which is the mineral feeders well let me not say the last one but at least we have this uh, three to be the, the commonest so we can have some other example so you can see this example here look at this diagram here you can see the animals eating from this thing here this thing has uh, a metal or a steel uh, stand and then this blue part here is made from tank so it helps to uh, contain their feed this is another example that we can look at you can see this one here let's see we can also have this one here as another example of the feed this is another example of the uh, feeding trough so those are the examples of the feeding trough so let us move to the next specimen now, which is our specimen G. Specimen G. Specimen G. That is our egg candler. The egg candler. So what is an egg candler and what is it used for? The egg candler is actually an instrument that helps to detect if a particular egg is viable. It is used to detect if the particular egg is viable. It is used to observe the growth. It is used to observe growth. To observe the growth and development. And development. Of an egg. Particularly during incubation. So, yes, they want to know well the of the egg or the embryo that is inside the egg so they want to know if that particular egg is actually incubating properly the device is used for testing the egg particularly the developing incubation to determine if they are still viable yes to determine if they are viable that is its function to determine if they are viable and now uh, we have different types of them we have the old candler use uh, we have the old candler we have different types of candler but the old type uh, of candler is the use of candle which is implanted into a box that is well shaded then it will be it will have a hole at the top of it that the egg can stay without falling through into the uh, the box so it will uh, permit light to go into the bulb. That is what you're actually seeing. It will permit light to go into the bulb, preventing it from falling through. So this is an example of the candler that we're talking about. You can see this is a modern candler. And so it has the egg standing on it. So when they switch it on, this is what I'm talking about, the modern candler. When they switch it on here, when they power it on here, the egg on it will have light shown on it such that we'll be having some of this that we have in this box here as what the image of the egg will be. So it tells to know, it helps to know if the egg is actually developing or not. It helps to know if the egg is developing or not. You can see this one as well. You can see this as well. When we look here, we see this particular specimen too. This is another uh, egg candler having multiple eggs on it. So it shines light onto the egg so it will be able to uh, give you uh, the growth rate of the egg so that is what the candler is now let us pick our next specimen our next specimen is going to be the specimen H specimen H is our next specimen specimen H and what is the specimen H? it is a scoop net scoop net is our next specimen yes so what is a scoop net and what does it do a scoop net is 
uh, a fishing tool, a fishing gear. It is used to take out fish from the lower ends of a pond. It is used to take out fish from the lower end of a pond. A fishing net. On a long handle. Used to reach. It is used to reach the base or the bottom. The base or the bottom of a river or the other shallow waters. Now, it is depth into the water and rapidly uh, taken out to allow the uh, the fish pick up some of the uh, to allow the net pick up some of the fishes. So uh, it is a traditional fishing gear. Harvesting a fish using this particular gear requires you to bury the net deep into the water and rapidly bring it out again. Mm? That is how it is being used. Used rapidly by burying the, the net by burying the net burying the net into the water burying the net into the water and bringing it out bringing it up and out in a quick succession so that is how it is being used in a quick succession. This is an example of what the uh, fishing net, the scoop net rather, looks like. This is how it is. Usually the handle is longer than this and then it has a rope. So you dip this part here. The handle is longer than this and it has a rope. So you dip this net into the water and you quickly use it to pick up the fish uh, sample. So the next specimen we want to look at is going to be the specimen specimen I. Specimen I, which is sugar cane. Sugar cane. Sugar cane. That is our next specimen. Now it has its botanical name. The botanical name for uh sugar cane, we have it to be, we call it the saccharum officinarum. Saccharum we call it the saccharum officinarum officinali we call it the saccharum officinali, that is what it is being called. So, it is it is a perennial grass. This particular plant, the sugarcane, is a perennial grass. Yes, it takes, it has uh, a very, very long duration uh, of lifespan. It's a perennial grass and it is a raw material for sugar and ethanol. Raw material, sorry raw material for sugar and ethanol the raw material for sugar and ethanol and it has an average of uh, 2 to 6 meters tall it is a, a 2 to 6 meter tall uh, uh, plant usually found to be stout jointed it has stout okay With stout jointed, stout jointed uh, fibrous stalks, stout jointed fibrous stalks that are rich in sucrose, that are rich in sucrose. Yes, that is. Uh, about the sugar cane yes they are very very rich in sucrose they contain energy 
they contain contains energy like we have okay contains energy fats sugar vitamin c yes and it is an active antioxidant it is an antioxidant that helps to remove free radicals antioxidant yes it is an active antioxidant that removes that removes or fights free radicals it removes or fights free radicals that attack the body cells and organs yes so that is it converts free radicals or molecules that cause damage to body cells they are cultivated for their juice cultivated yes the sugar sugar cane is cultivated for its juice that is the major reason why the sugar cane is cultivated and the juice is used in sugar production is used in sugar production uh, and they are best grown in irrigated land best grown in irrigated land irrigated land so that is what uh, sugar cane is so that is what sugar cane is so they are planted in irrigated land so this is an example of what sugar cane is like you can see the stalk here you can see the stalk with short you can see that it has short jointed you can see the joints here now uh, you can see the joints you can see the joints here so they have short jointed fibrous roots and they are uh, perennial grasses so that is about the specimen i and then we are moving to specimen j specimen j specimen j so specimen j is uh, a pineapple fruit pineapple fruit that is our specimen j our specimen j is pineapple fruit so we need to know what pineapple fruit is uh what pineapple fruit is so let us quickly do this now we have just said that it is a fruit it's a uh, botanical name we have it to be we have its botanical name to be the ananas commosus ananas commosus if you notice that i am writing my botanical name the first letter of the name which is the a the ananas is in capital letter while the c starting the second word here is uh, in small letter that is how uh, botanical names or scientific names are being written so ananas commosus it is rich in vitamin c yes rich in vitamin c so it is also uh, uh, an active antioxidant it aids digestion aids digestion it aids digestion it enhances weight loss enhances weight loss yes uh, uh, the produce hormones yes that is another function of it it produces hormones in the body it helps in the uh, production of hormones in the body and the particular hormone that it produces is called the bromelain which is responsible for skin healing bromelain bromelain is the skin hormone that it produces for skin healing yes now they are found largely they are large tropical fruits with spiky yes let me do this they are large tropical fruits large tropical fruits large tropical 
fruits largely uh, grown they have spiky thorns spiky uh, tough skin with spiky with spiky tough skin and with sweet inside now one of the disadvantages of taking excess amount of uh, pineapple is that it can cause nausea disadvantages now disadvantages of taking excess of this particular fruit yeah, it can cause nausea it can result to uh, diarrhea vomiting is another thing that can result from excess consumption of this particular uh, fruit it can cause abdominal pain abdominal pain it can also result in heartburn heart bone so these are few of the things that can result from excess consumption of this particular fruit so we can see example of the fruit here this is an example of what pineapple fruit looks like you can see them uh, you can see all of the uh, the round spiky back that it has uh, and this the back is very very tough then it has this part as what it can uh, uh, that that is the vegetative uh, part of this particular fruit. The vegetative part is this part here that can be planted to have more of that particular fruit. So the next specimen we'll be talking about now is going to be the specimen K. Specimen specimen K, which is the ginger. Ginger. Now ginger is a rhizoid is a rhizome that has uh, many uh, nutritional and healing abilities. It is used by healers, majorly used in places like China, India, and the rest of those. Now, its botanical name is, or it is called the Zingiba officinale. Zingiba, it is called the Zingiba officinale that is what it is called it looks like turmeric this is uh what the ginger looks like so this is this is what the ginger looks like we have it looking like this huh? it has its own plants let me show you how the plant looks the plant the plant looks like this you can see uh these are the roots uh the, the rhizome formed here that is where you have the uh the ginger itself and this is the stem this is how the stem looks so we have different varieties of the ginger it also looks like the turmeric so let us quickly see some of the uh, characteristics that we can talk about for this particular uh, organism we said it is a rhizome a rhizome used for uh, spice and used as spice and then for its healing abilities. It's used as spice uh, for its healing ability. It increases the serotonin and dopamine levels in the body. Increases, these are hormones that are needed, enzymes that are needed in the body. It increases the serotonin and dopamine levels and dopamine levels in the body yes the reduce inflammation yes, that is another function of the ginger reduction of inflammation so that is one of the healing uh, uh, abilities it is good for anxiety depression it helps to alleviate anxiety alleviate anxiety depression yes because in fact we have people who chew them ordinarily without using them in uh, any meal it also helps 
to alleviate dementia, forgetfulness, as well as the Alzheimer's diseases. We have the Alzheimer's diseases or something called the PST, PST uh, PTSD, PTSD, that is post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic, that is the meaning of uh, the PTSD, stress disorder. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So ginger can help to alleviate all of this. It eases stomach pain as well. Eases stomach pain. It eases stomach pain. And then it uh, so, so and then it eases uh, or treats no, uh, nausea and motion sickness. Treats nausea and motion sickness. So those are some of the things that this particular plant do. We have said earlier on, it is also an herbaceous perennial plant that prevents swine flu. Herbaceous uh, perennial plant that prevents swine flu. Prevents swine flu. So we have talked about the uh, ginger now. So this is its picture. We can see it here. So let us move to the next specimen now. The next specimen we'll be having is going to be the specimen L, which is honey. Specimen L. Specimen L. And that is honey. Specimen L is honey. So what is honey? I believe all of us know what honey is, so let us quickly uh, talk about it and then we talk about its nutritional uh, or health implications. Now, honey is gotten from honeybees. Yes, that is where it is gotten from. From honeybees, when you actually go through their beehive, in their hive or comb, in their hive, that particular thing that they have found is called the hive or the comb so it is thick sweet fluid the honey is a thick sweet fluid that is gotten by the bees from plant nectar produced by the bees produced by bees from plant nectar from plant nectar. That is where they get them from. So they are used as sweeteners in food. Used as sweeteners. Used as sweeteners in food. And they have anti inflammatory. Yes, they have. They are anti inflammatory. They are also antioxidants and anti antibacterial. Antibacterial in nature. Antibacterial in nature. They are better for blood sugar. Yes, they are sweeteners and then better for blood sugar. So somebody who is having diabetes can stop taking sugar and take this particular uh uh, species, which is what the uh, sorry, the specimen which is honey. Yes, it also boosts immunity. It boosts the immunity of the body. The immunity. It boosts the body's immunity. So we have different ways through which you can test to know what the true honey is. One of the ways through which you can test to know the honey bee is by actually pouring the honey into a cup of water. If the honey mixes with your water, then it is not uh, original honey. Another way is by putting a matchstick into the honey. If you put a matchstick into the honey and you try to strike it, you find out that it ignites. 
if it were to be a fake honey, the, uh, the, the match stick will become moist and so it will be unable to uh, ignite. Another method is by you pouring it in a particular uh, spot. If it is being gathered by ant in no time, then it is not real honey. If it were to be real honey, ants will not gather it. And lastly, we have another one, which is you actually putting it into a freezer. Real honey doesn't freeze when you put this, uh, when you put it into a freezer. So those are few tests to know uh, real honey. So we have this as example of the honey. This is an example of the honey, and we can see this is another example of the honey as well. You can see the honey comb here. This is the the bees in their uh, net, in their hive. This is their hive. This here is what we refer to as their hive. And each of these things here, they are the, the bees. So they are in their hive having uh, the production of uh, honey done. So that is what the specimen L, honey, is about. So let us move to the next specimen now. Which is so we have specimen M now to be the sawdust. Specimen M. So let's let's have it here. Specimen M, which is our saw dust. So that is what we want to look at quickly. So specimen M is gotten from the wood. We use the wood. Uh, it is the wood that is being uh, cut and shaved to get specimen M. So we say it is a byproduct or a waste product of woodworking. Byproduct. It is a byproduct or the waste gotten from woodworks of woodwork. Now, uh, this particular sawdust has its own use. Uh, it has its uses. Well, uh, woodworking operations. In, uh, we have some operations like sawing. Operations such as sawing, that's cutting of wood. We have milling and planking, milling and planing of wood. So each time we have to do all of this, we eventually have the production of uh, of the small chippings of wood. So it is composed of the small chippings, composed of the small chippings of the small chippings of wood so the sawmill the sawdust rather as we said can be gotten from sawmills wherever you have the uh, cutting and the slicing of uh, planks and wood so it has some advantages this uh, particular specimen the sawdust it has some advantages advantages like okay advantages now or it uses functions so a few of them will be listed here we have uh, uh, soaking up spills it is used to soak up spills soak up spills wherever there is let's assume we have uh, oil or water spilling somewhere you can just add uh, the sawdust to it so it can soak up the spill so after which you have to sweep it all up. Also, we have it to, uh, uh, it is used as fire starter, so a fire starter. It is used as a fire starter it is because it is highly combustible, so it can be used in igniting fire. It also fills wood. It is also used in filling wood, filling wood holes. So whenever you have a hole in a wood, you can use sawdust to fill up that hole. It is used in cleaning floors as well. It is a cleaner, cleaner for the floor. So it is used in cleaning the floor. So we have those as uh, example of the. Uh, uh, sorry, advantages of sawdust. Also, it can be used mixed with manure or the supplement. It can be used as feed for plants, mixed with manure uh, for the plants to absorb them 
up. So those are the advantages that we have for the sawdust. So this is an example of what the sawdust look like. So we have this as an example of the sawdust. You can see this particular picture here. That is what the sawdust looks like. This is another example of what the sawdust looks like. You can see it with a collection of wood pieces there. So it is from the wood pieces when they are sawing the, the wood. That is where we have the production of the sawdust. Our next uh, specimen is going to be the specimen N, which is wood shavings. Specimen N. Specimen N. Specimen N. So we said it is wood shavings. So there is a very, very fine uh, difference between the specimen M and the specimen N. Sawdust and wood shavings, they are actually gotten from the same uh, material, from wood. So why are they now uh, different? Wood shaving is a base uh, layer with thick covering of straw. It's a base layer with thick covering of straw. Uh, it is a waste obtained when wood is shaped or planed using a carpentry tool. It is popularly used as bedding in poultry. Yes, this particular specimen that we're talking about is not like the sawdust. The sawdust is a dust particle. It's made of dust particles, but the wood shaving is not actually dust particle. It, 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 it is in layers. So we said that it is a base layer with thick covering. A base layer. With thick coverings, with thick coverings of straw. So it is a waste that is obtained, a waste obtained when wood is shaped or planed. When wood is shaped or Planed. That is when we obtain the wood shaving using when wood is planed or shaped using a carpentry tool. Using a carpentry carpentry tool. So uh, it is from the tool that we get this extraction of this particular material. It is popularly used as bedding in poultry. Popularly used. Popularly used as bedding in poultry. Even in some pens, it is used in poultry. It is also used in some uh, pens. It is used as bedding in uh, poultry and in pens. So, this is an example of what the wood shaving looks like. If you see this now, you see that it is not like this particular one here. It is not like this particular one. We have this. This is an example of wood shaving. So we can see example of wood shaving. Unlike this one here, that is uh, sawdust. This is sawdust. You can see the dust particles from this one here. Uh, these are examples of sawdust. This one here, these are examples of sawdust. But this one is not, sorry, this one here is not uh, sawdust. It's not sawdust. This is wood shaving. So that is that about wood shaving. So the next specimen we have now before us, that specimen O. Specimen O is electric bulb. Specimen O. Specimen O, that is electric bulb. That is our specimen O, electric bulb. So we want to look at what electric bulb is. Electric bulb actually gives light. It produces light. Uh, and for this particular purpose, we'll be looking at the type of light that it produces and then what it can be used for. It is um, uh, electric bulb, like the name implies, it is gotten from electricity. The power behind it is electricity, powered by electricity. Electricity powered. 
Um, so, uh, it is smokeless. It is smokeless. It doesn't produce or generate any smoke except in rare cases where the bulb is uh, faulty. So, it uses wire filament to glow on uh, application of electricity. Uh, uses wire filament to glow on application of on application of electricity so when power is run through it when power is permitted to uh, pass through it when you run current into it the filament the wire filament starts to glow so it produces light or luminosity it produces light or we say luminosity luminosity for the surrounding and then heat that is used in poultry to keep beds warm as well as heat heat in the poultry to keep the birds warm to keep birds warm so that is the major reason why we make use of uh, electric uh, bulb particularly in the poultry so we know that it is uh, electrically powered and it is smokeless it uses wire filament to glow when electricity is allowed to run through it and then it produces light as well as heat it produces light for luminosity for us to be able to see and then it also generates heat energy the heat energy is what is used to uh, produce or to generate heat uh, to give warmth for the birds in the poultry so that is that about specimen O let us quickly see a picture showing the specimen O so these are examples showing a uh, bulb this is an example of a bulb you can see it so it produces this thing in the middle here is what we refer to as the wire filament so it is that thing that glues that gives out the luminosity and then the filament gets heated up and it starts to radiate the heat to the surrounding so this is an example of the filament you can have this as well as example of a bulb you can see it. this is another example of a bulb so that is what we have for the specimen O and then we have specimen P now to be kerosene lamp specimen P which is kerosene kerosene lamp that is our specimen P so here we'll be talking about specimen P as its function we're talking about its function so one of the function of specimen P is what the functions of specimen O is we said that specimen O is used to generate heat and uh, luminosity so that is what the kerosene lamp is also doing but it is powered differently the kerosene lamp is powered using a particular fuel the fuel it is using is kerosene it uses kerosene it uses kerosene as its primary fuel or as its fuel unlike the uh, specimen O which is electric bulb which uses electricity to, uh, to actually give out its own glue so it uses uh, uh, this particular electric kerosene lamp uses uh, kerosene as its own fuel sometimes it smokes it smokes it gives out smokes it smokes particularly when you don't care very well for it it has a wick or mantle possession of wick or mantle this wick or mantle helps to protect the glass uh, it is protected by the glass or uh, uh, the glass chimney or glue the wick or the mantle is what carries a thread like substance that actually uh, is soaked in the fuel so it can give out its light so it has a wick or mantle carrying carrying the thread like substance the thread like 
substance which is actually being lit. So it is this that is being protected, protected by the glass chimney. Glass chimney is protected by a glass chimney or the glue. So that is what helps to protect it. So this is what I am saying here. All right. So if you look at the middle here, there is something in the middle here, somewhere around here. That thing is the chimney. Uh, sorry, is the wick, the wick or the mantle. So it carries the thread that comes into this lower part of the lantern or the kerosene lamp. So that thing is what we actually put our flame to so that it can start glowing. So it is covered by this outer uh, uh, appearance, which is the globe or the, the glass chimney. So that is what the kerosene lamp is about. Now, it is also used in providing warmth for poultry beds. It is also used in providing warmth for poultry beds. So we use it also like the uh, specimen O is being used, like the electric bulb is being used. It also provides luminosity as well as heat for poultry beds. And lastly, we have the specimen, specimen Q. Specimen Q. Specimen Q is the charcoal pot. The charcoal pot. So, like we have been talking about generation of heat as well, this one also generates heat, though it doesn't generate as much luminosity as the electric bulb and the kerosene lamp does. So, uh, it generates heat as well. It is also used to generate heat, and the heat can also be used like others are being used in the poultry. Yes, it can also be used to provide heat for the poultry bed. So, we said it is also used also for the production or generation of heat. So, that is the function of the charcoal pot. Though it is used extensively in other areas, like the charcoal pot can be used in domestic cooking, can be used for domestic cooking, also for domestic cooking in the kitchen, domestic cooking. So it can be used in boiling at home and the rest of those. So those are the uh, functions of the specimen Q. So here is an example of what the specimen Q looks like. You can see this. This is an example of what specimen Q looks like. That is an example of a charcoal pot. Huh? This is another example of a charcoal pot. You can see it is in this place here that you have your charcoal. And then when you light it, it starts to burn. And then we have ashes falling down into this lower part. Huh? We can have our charcoal here. Huh? Our charcoal can be here after which the burning brings out ashes under it. So that is what we have for uh, our uh, agricultural science practical. I believe going through this is going to help us a long way in our examination. Don't forget to like our page, share this page, subscribe to it, and give us your comments. We want to have your take on everything that you have heard so far. Thank you very much, and God bless.